If you have your Bibles, you might like to turn to Isaiah 57. I'm not sure about you, but I can't quite believe we're already entering the fourth week of January. I'm not quite sure how that's happened, but um, it's, of course, our third Sunday of the new year. And uh, we've got sort of people still coming and going a bit, don't we? Some people back from holidays, some people taking an opportunity to get away, and some people waiting till everyone's gone back to school and then going, probably, if you've got that option. Um, <coughs> And, you know, I think it's a time of the year, isn't it, when we start to think about what's happening for the year. Um, certainly, you know, um, for those of us who are working, returning to work and back to school kind of starting to be back on the radar. For those of you who are either in the thick of parenting or have parented, you'll understand the tension there is with the summer holidays between when you're not quite ready to be back into the daily grind of every day to getting everybody up and out the door and all of those sorts of things, you know, but then the tension of that compared to everybody still being in the house together. I don't think I'm quite ready to say yet that I'm ready for them to be back to school, but, um, and I don't think they're definitely ready to say that they want to be back to school but uh, it's that time of the year and we prepare ourselves in many ways. I'm sure many of you thinking about um, what your commitments are this year, um, what things you are going to do, what things you may not do, what worked well last year and you want to carry forward into this year, what things that in fact um, that season has finished. And as a church, like many churches worldwide at Vision, we do place high value at this beginning point in our year on seeking what God is saying to us. What is he directing us to? And I'm sure many of you do that at a personal level as well. Um, and we don't ever want to be presumptuous or just make decisions based on our good intentions and our good ideas. And Justin and I have been at Vision for over 18 years now and I would say that it has been my experience over that time every year that God has been faithful and that the word that has been brought at the beginning of the year has had both a personal and a corporate relevance and that I find as the year unfolds Perhaps what we've heard at the beginning of the year starts to get more clarification or at times even just the need to lean it back into that and remind myself. Um, and so Andrew brought a very clear word to us from the Lord um, for 2020, one that interestingly, but I think not surprisingly because God is God, that has actually been echoed around the world by other leaders as they have brought a word to their churches for the year. And that's an exhortation to wake up, to stay alert and to be sober-minded about the times and the seasons that we're in and to get ready and be prepared. And I think um, certainly in our current situation as a nation, it's very um, evident to us that to stay in a state of preparedness is much easier when there are obvious conditions surrounding the need to be prepared. Um, but what happens when things just become mundane, normal and calm again? So the messaging from the ACT emergency services this week has really reflected that challenge of them kind of continuing to want to say to Canberrans and the surrounding region, even though there's been a bit of rain, even though there's been easing conditions in our region with the fires, we do need to stay prepared and alert. And I really feel that that's where the word that Adam brought us last week comes in and was a really timely one because what he was exhorting us to do was to make every effort. I feel like when it's obvious that the conditions require it, we tend to be just a little bit more vigilant. Um, but when the pressure's off, is often the time that we kind of sink back into our old habits. And so Adam exhorted us to make every effort to be intentional and diligent to keep growing this year. And that even when there are easing conditions or other distractions, that we are not to 
allow that to, to um, cause us to put things off or to become complacent. And so if you weren't here for either of those two messages, I would really encourage you to get a hold of a copy um, for either through our podcast or for those of you where that's not a technology that you access, it is possible to burn a CD for you on that. Um, to actually be intentional, to seek out what is God saying to us this year and to grab a hold of that intentionally. And so today is my first opportunity to share with you for 2020. And my hope by his grace is to express what he's put on my heart and just to allow him room to further establish what he's saying to us here at Vision for 2020. So to that end, I will pray and then we will um, read the, the, a couple of um, verses out of Isaiah 57. Father, we are grateful and just want to acknowledge your faithfulness in talking to us and leading us as your people. And so this morning, God, as we open your word and continue to just incline our ears to what you're saying to us, I ask that you would help us. And I do want to acknowledge and thank you, God, that the fallibility of human words never in, impacts the infallibility of your word. And so, God, I ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning. We do just choose to humble ourselves before you and to be teachable as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're just going to read two verses in Isaiah 57 this morning. Um, this is verses 14 and 15 of Isaiah 57. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. Remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. There are many ways that a sermon comes together. Sorry for peering at you over my glasses. Me and multifocals never became friends and so this was my optometrist's solution. He said, you just have to perch them on the end of your nose so that you can read down there. So anyway, that's what's happening. Um, there are many ways that a sermon comes together. Um, and the seeds of this sermon for me started a little differently I, I'm during worship last Sunday. And I felt or thought that I felt God asking me to kneel. This was during worship. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't hit the decks immediately. I wrestled around with it for a bit. And I've certainly knelt reasonably often, I think, in worship and in prayer because I've been so aware of God's presence and holiness that to kneel just seems like the only thing to do. But this was a little bit different. This felt more like he was asking me to make a choice to obey. And I actually felt quite uncomfortable. I, that's probably why it took me a while to comply. And, you know, it round in my head was, is this God, is it not? And for me personally, I don't like contrived things. Like I don't like to do things um, that don't seem authentic. And so, um, and I actually don't like being told what to do. <laughs> um, so... I wrestled around with that. There's no one else here like that, is there? Um, so I wrestled around with it for a bit, but it was pretty persistent that I just, you need to kneel. So anyway, I did kneel. And immediately God gave me this simple phrase, um, and we were singing the song Surrounded at the time, but we fight our battles on our knees, not in defeat, but in surrender. 
We fight our battles on our knees, not in defeat, but in surrender. And so actually I tucked that away in my notebook. I thought really actually that it was a word personally for me. Um, last year wasn't personally a particularly easy year for me. In fact, it was quite a painful year with a lot of things happening that felt very out of my control. And so I had wrestled personally with feeling quite defeated many times and feeling actually like I'd been knocked off my feet. So for me, it actually made sense personally that this was a call to surrender and just a recognition that being on my knees doesn't mean that I'm defeated. But as I began to prepare for this weekend and preaching this Sunday, and I started asking God for direction on a sermon, which usually starts for me with a passage of scripture, but this time didn't, this phrase came really strongly to mind again. We fight our battles on our knees, not in defeat, but in surrender. So I chatted to Adam about it. He said, well, you know, often the best sermons are the sermons that we need to hear ourselves. And um, but what I found God starting to do was to direct my attention to the link between our physical posture when we're relating to him and the condition or the attitude of our hearts. And actually with that in mind, when you look for it, there are actually many, many biblical examples of this where um, somebody's physical posture as they relate to the Lord reflects or has an impact on the condition or attitude of their hearts. And so here are just a few examples that I found as I was looking into this this week. Um, in Luke chapter 8, verse 41, we begin reading the story of Jairus. And Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue and we're told that he falls at Jesus' feet because his daughter is dying. And as a father, his fear and grief and sense of powerlessness to be able to do anything to save his daughter brings him in complete desperation and recognition that Jesus is his only hope and the way that he expresses that is that he falls on his knees. Um, an old, a couple of Old Testament um, examples. In Daniel chapter 6, we read of Daniel who fights a battle by actually getting on his knees before God three times a day in direct opposition to the injunction from King Darius, who tells them, you are not to bow down to anybody but me. And so Daniel's response actually as um, a battle strategy is to kneel down before God three times a day. And then in 1 Kings 18, um, we read about the prophet Elijah. And what it does is this is he's prayed for rain to stop and there's been a three and a bit year drought and now he's coming back before the Lord to, um, to pray for rain. But the way that it describes what he does is it describes his physical posture. It says that he bows himself down to the earth, putting his head between his knees and there's actually no description or even mention of him praying just his physical posture and his seven expectant requests of his servant to go and look for rain before that um, cloud the size of a man's hand begins to form in the sky. And it just got me thinking, is it possible to pray and seek God just with our posture and not our mouth? Like, can we reflect to God something just using our bodies? I don't know if any of you have watched the clips that have been on both the news and um, at, during this time of bushfire, but they have the, um, the Auslan interpreters at the front. They're just amazing. And I don't really know much Auslan. I learned a little bit when I was at uni. But um, I find it amazing that as much as the use of their hands 
is the use of their face. Have you watched, I mean, their facial expressions while they're communicating what they need to communicate is quite incredible. So it's not unusual for us to think about the use of particularly body language and facial expressions in a part of our communication. But I feel like this has been um, just a really bringing to my attention that whole use of our body and our posture as we approach the Lord. And so then I went um, to Luke 10, and if you want to turn there, you can. In Luke 10, we find um, a very familiar account of Mary and Martha, and just this example of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And as I was looking at this account again this week, there was something really new that grab my attention. So a quick recap of the story, I won't read it out, but you've got Mary and Martha, for those who don't know the story, sisters, um, and Jesus and the disciples rock up for a meal. And Mary sits herself at the Lord's feet to listen to his teaching. And Martha's flapping about in the kitchen and getting a bit cranky that her sister's not helping her. That's the potted version. And when I've read the story, my attention is usually on Martha because I relate to her. And I've always imagined that beautiful, perfect, creative, worshipful Mary has just been overcome with love for Jesus and is um, in some super spiritual state um, at his feet. Like that that's how I imagine it, possibly showing my biases. But... Um, but actually what's happening is that she's sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him teach. And this was completely countercultural for the day for women. They didn't get to sit in on teaching. And so um, it, it actually is a posture of learning. She's sitting at his feet l- listening to him teach. But there was this phrase in verse 42 that really jumped out to me this time. Um, Jesus is describing to Martha that she needs to not be quite so worried and troubled about many things. And then he uses this phrase. He says, Mary has chosen. Mary has chosen. And what I suddenly realised is that she wasn't in some ecstatic, spontaneous moment of worship where she couldn't contain herself and so fell on her face in front of Jesus. She actually chose as an act of her will to sit at Jesus' feet. Now, we can't know if that was hard for her. We don't know what self-talk she had to push through, what misgivings she was feeling and how uncomfortable it was for her to stay there in a room of men also learning from Jesus when that was not what she'd been brought up with. That was not the cultural expectation. We've no idea what was going on for her. But what we do know is that she did reject all the conventions of her culture and she put herself in subjection to Christ, kneeling at his feet to listen and learn from him. And in her posture, her physical, the physical use of her body, She conveyed that she was teachable, surrendered, and humble. And I've never, quite honestly, considered Mary to be courageous until this point, because that's exactly what she was as she chose to kneel at Jesus' feet in that moment. She actually was fighting a battle, so to speak, on her knees. And so this, for me, cemented the truth that sometimes we will spontaneously express our heart to God with our bodies. That might be falling on our knees. It may be clapping or dancing or raising our hands in worship. Sometimes that just flows out of us as a spontaneous reflection of what's going on in our hearts. But at other times we can deliberately choose to physically position ourselves in order to prepare our hearts and minds before the Lord. 
Does that make sense? So sometimes it's spontaneous and sometimes the very act of physically positioning ourselves before the Lord in a certain way actually prepares our hearts and minds. So it's not because of our heart and mind that we position ourselves in that way, but sometimes even in spite of and certainly to direct our heart and mind towards the Lord. So that may include things like choosing to open your hands to demonstrate a willingness to receive from the Lord. It may look like raising your hands to actually direct your soul to bless and worship him. It may look like choosing to bend your knee as an act of surrender, obedience or repentance. Sometimes... We can't just wait till we feel like it. It takes humility to do things when we don't feel like it. We have to push past our awkwardness and our pride and simply surrender. And this is what I believe that God is asking us to do this year to choose to humble ourselves, not to just wait until we feel like it, but in obedience to prepare our hearts and our minds by bowing low. And this is why. Because he's God, obviously. He is worthy of our praise and our adoration and our surrender. And the reason why is because one of the hallmarks of awakening and revival throughout history has been the repentance, humility and surrender of God's people. A contrite and humble spirit attracts the very presence of God. And that is what we read in these two verses in Isaiah 57 and is reflected in many other places throughout Scripture. That God not only inhabits eternity, but he dwells with the contrite and humble or lowly of spirit and revives them. If you look back at those um, verses that we've read in Isaiah 57, I'll just read them again. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That word revive means to save, to recover, to be restored to life and health, to cause to grow and to make alive. Another very familiar revival passage that I'm sure many of you know is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and it puts it this way. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, and this implies a choice right there. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves, choose to humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. To bow low is not a passive strategy. To humble ourselves is more than just a peaceful protest at the state of our own hearts and the state of the heart of the world around us. This is actually a battle strategy. We get on our knees, not in defeat, but in surrender. I don't think for a minute that God is looking for us to institute a kneeling program this year, but I do think... The serious question that we need to ask ourselves is how will we choose to position ourselves as 
his body in 2020. Sometimes we fall to our knees spontaneously because we feel like it. And sometimes we get to our knees choosing as an act of our will, subjecting our body and our heart to him in obedience and humility, in dependence and trust to once again seek to align our heart with his. And so my question to you and my question to myself, because this is most definitely the sermon I need to hear, is are we willing to wake up and to get ready, making every effort and choosing to bow low and to humble ourselves before our incredible almighty God in order that he would revive us individually as a church, as the church, and as a nation. And what I feel, it's not a long sermon this morning, I I feel like there's more that God wants to communicate to us than is really even possible to communicate in um, words. And I feel like and believe and really even want to declare over you this morning that um, this isn't a message we can just sort of hear and then we are going to get to the sausage chisel, I promise, but just head out and have a sausage. Um, I believe that this morning there is an invitation for us to activate as his people. And so I'm going to ask you this morning to choose to kneel. I don't mind whether that's in your seat. And obviously I understand that for some people that isn't physically possible. So we can still posture ourselves in a way before the Lord whether our knees physically can hit the floor or not. Um, But what I, I want to ask us to do this morning as a congregation, as God's people who meet here at Vision Christian Fellowship in Fishwick, I want us to actually respond to what I believe the Lord is saying to us for this year and to position ourselves on our knees. That might feel contrived and it may feel awkward, but actually, I don't know, I think there's going to be lots of times this year where we're going to feel awkward and that we're just going to have to get over ourselves. Um, so, um, and, and so I'm going to invite you to do that. You can come up the front, you can stay in your seat, wherever you would like to position yourself before the Lord this morning. I'm just going to invite you to do that. I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then I'm going to encourage you to spend a bit more time with the Lord yourself in that posture, just seeing what he wants to say to you this morning. Obviously, after we've done that, if any of you have come this morning um, needing prayer, we have a prayer team who would love to pray for you. But I really believe that we just need to do this first. So, Heavenly Father, this morning we bow the knee to you as an active choice. We choose, God, as your people to humble ourselves before you, to respond to you. Lord, we worship you, we honour you, And we just acknowledge, God, our complete dependence upon you. 
God, we don't kneel with a specific outcome in mind. We don't kneel actually because we want you to do anything. We kneel, God, to honour you and in obedience. And we trust, God, that this year you will do what only you can do. But we choose to position ourselves and our desire is to have our hearts and our minds aligned with you. And we ask God that you would come and that you would revive us. Whatever that looks like, God. We ask God that you would revive us. We seek you, God. <laughs> 